Uh, thank you for joining us for yet another uh, Flatten the Curve Summit session. Um, we have an amazing uh, speaker here. We have Dina Gillia Whitaker, um, and she's going to talk about indigenous knowledge and the discipline of planetary health. Um, she is a lecturer of American Indian Studies at California State University, San Marcos. Um, she's an independent consultant and educator in environmental justice policy planning. Her research focuses on indigenous nationalism, self-determination, environmental justice, and education. And uh, in this time period, when we're seeing so much upheaval in our world, I can't think of a better talk. So thank you and welcome. Thank you, Sean. Why peace not seal ku isquis dina jilio whitaker is makalak squis nux boos. I'm coming to you from the indigenous uh, and traditional unceded homeland of the Ahashiman and Payam Coetian people here in Southern California in Orange County. And uh, I, by way of introduction, I am a descendant of the Colville Confederated Tribes in Washington State but born and raised here in Southern California um, as somebody that considers herself a member of um, the indigenous American Indian diaspora in the US. So, um, and as Sean mentioned, I teach American Indian studies at Cal State San Marcos, and I do a lot of outside educating and consulting around um, a whole lot of, a uh, whole, whole wide variety of issues pertaining to um, indigenous um, well, American Indian uh, policy and worldview and environmental justice and all kinds of stuff. So um, let's go ahead and get into it here. So I want to give the kind of backstory. Um, I come to this work kind of most immediately through this book that I um, wrote that was released last year called As Long As Grass Grows, The Indigenous Fight for Environmental Justice from Colonization to Standing Rock. This is my second book. Um, it looks uh, at what environmental justice looks like from an indigenous perspective. Um, it began as a grad school project, uh, as a master's thesis, and, uh, and it takes a, a decolonizing framework um, and methodology to understand what environmental justice, um, how, the way that we talk about it um, in terms of uh, academics, in terms of theory, um, policy and law, and praxis, like activism, um, how it does not um, accommodate um, indigenous people. And um, so there are like huge problems with that. And that's uh, what, what this book addresses. And so to that end, um, not only is it a, a decolonizing um, project, but it's also indigenizing. We look, uh, I, I argue that the field of environmental justice needs to be indigenized um, in addition to being um, decolonized. And, and there are differences in those perspectives. So one does not necessarily mean the other. Um, I also come to this as a journalist um, I've been working as a journalist for um, probably 20 years, doing various freelance kinds of projects, and um, and I recount some of the the stories that I had worked on um, that include going to Standing Rock, um, being part of that movement, also um, some of the other uh, projects that I was involved in years ago, um, where I saw some of the issues playing out firsthand, issues of racism, anti-Indianism, things like that. Uh, in our communities. Um, so so I, the, the book is really a culmination of different types of methodological approaches um, from that perspective. So, and uh, it's place-based. And from an indigenous uh, like methodology, uh, we place a huge emphasis and importance on understanding uh, the research that we do is place-based, and so as such, this book really starts the research, the initial research began as a research project here in my home community in Southern California that had to do with the protection of an indigenous sacred site um, that, uh, that also contributed, it was part of a, um, a larger uh, phenomenon that was about protecting what the local 
surf community, because I live in a surf, a beach town, a surf community, um, uh, it, it was a, the project was about protecting this beach from the building of a road, which would have ruined this world famous surf site called Trestles. But in the end, as it turned out, it really had a, a lot to do with the fact that there was a Native American sacred site um, also on in that land in that space that contributed to the to the prohibiting or the the blocking of that project from ever going through so that's uh, that's really how this thing started and then it built from there looking at um, environmental issues and then also indigenous knowledge and how that comes into it and I will get into that in just a moment so um, so the regarding the book um, environmental justice the way that we know it um, it really begins with certain kinds of assumptions um, and it begins with the concept of, env of environmental racism um, which um, which begins with the the, the presumption that um, that there is such a thing as environmental racism and that it has to do with the targeting of, of communities of color um, for toxic development and other kinds of harmful processes that place environmental risk and harm um, disproportionately on communities of color and also poor communities, but especially communities of color. So, um, so it takes racism as the central uh, like lens that it views it through. Um, it pause it so in that regard, it pauses the redis redistribution of environmental risk and harm. Um, to to make it you know more evenly distributed so that communities of color are not targeted in that way. Um, but my argument is that in the book I argue that this uh, this frame of environmental racism is far far uh, inadequate to account for indigenous histories of genocide uh, of colonialism settler colonialism. Uh, which includes genocide, land theft, and ecocide. Um, ecocide is a process that indigenous scholars write about that connects um, the killing. If we talk about ecocide, we break it down. Ecocide really means the killing of an ecosystem, um, the killing of an ecosystem, just like the word genocide talks about the killing of a people, um, a collective group of people. So um, in the literature, in the research, um, ecocide is always connected to genocide. Um, and so environmental justice, the way we, that it's understood in the US, um, does not account for any of these histories. Um, uh, an example of ecocide in, in Indian country is um, the very well-documented, well-known history of uranium mining in the Southwest, um, especially with the Navajo Nation, where um, decades of, of uh, reckless uranium mining has still, uh, is still poisoning the lands of those people with, you know, thousands or hundreds to thousands of um, abandoned uranium mines completely un, un, uh, unmitigated and unremediated still poisoning the land. Um, and then also the, now the renewed push to mine for uranium in those areas by the Trump administration. Okay, so, um, so indigenous knowledge, like what does it have to do with all of this? Um, from, from uh, and the image that I'm, I'm giving you here is uh, I'm, I'm also going to provide you some, some resources and references for those of you who are interested in exploring this more. Um, this book is um, the most recent book to come out on traditional ecological knowledge, and um, it's a fantastic resource, um, pretty uh, state-of-the-art for uh, the research in this area. Uh, comes out by, or it's put out by Cambridge University Press, so it's a um, highly respected um, source of knowledge. So, um, so my argument in all of this, and not just mine, but you know, the 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 people who are doing the the best research in this in this area of environmental justice, is that um, that environmental justice. One of the things that it doesn't do is it doesn't account for um, indigenous knowledge and different relationship to land. 
So indigenous people who are people who have been occupying territories for you know thousands and tens of thousands of years, um, including here in the U.S. And, and and I guess I should say you know we this is very U.S. centric. This is my project to, because it's within the context of the nation state. Um, so in the context of the U.S. Um, the way that we talk about environmental justice, you know, does not recognize that indigenous people have a much different relationship to land than um, the settler population does, which, you know, we could talk about being um, more uh, f focused on the, the utilitarian use of land, um, how we use the land for extractive purposes, for uh, you know, in a framework of private property um, and and economics. So different indigenous people's relationship is much, much different from that. Um, and so this is an epistemological issue. And um, and so, um, you know, we say that in, in the context of the state, um, indigenous people have what we call a rights-based society versus a responsibility-based uh, society. That is, uh, the, the state imagines um, its relationship to land or even to its government as being a rights-based um, view or um, you know, paradigm versus from an indigenous society perspective. Um, we, we say that we live in a responsibilities-based paradigm where we perceive ourselves as um, responsible to, to our environment and to each other as communities. So, um, so traditional ecological knowledge um, is really a subset of what we would call indigenous knowledge. There are many types of indigenous knowledges, just as many as there are nations and tribes, and we're talking over well over 500. So um, these are not uh, universal concepts. This is not based on universal knowledge. These are always place-based. They are uh, specific to location, to an ecosystem, to land. Um, and even though you know, we can say that this is not universal knowledge, there are still commonalities that we can uh, that we can talk about to engage the, these very different types of knowledge systems that we're talking about. Um, another factor in all of this is the, is the idea that uh, the relationship of indigenous peoples to biodiversity. Um, lots of research, uh, and increasingly it does this, um, shows the, the very critical relationship between um, uh, cultural diversity and biodiversity, and you know the fact that um, 80 I think the, the United Nations says that 80 percent of the, the world's most biodiverse places still are controlled by indigenous populations, and so that's on a global scale. Um, there, if you see this this resource here, this link is a link to a paper that talks about that, kind of the most recent one that came out within the last year. Um, and so, you know, you can check that out later. Um, but uh, a, a really important part of this, talking about biodiversity and indigenous knowledge especially, is that um, indigenous knowledge, and, especially, and particularly traditional ecological knowledge, is not just, uh, while it is philosophical, you know, we can talk about it in terms of philosophy and um, and epist epistemology, um, it is more than that. Uh, indigenous knowledge is, has always been um, applied knowledge. It's always been um, knowledge that was used to actively manage landscapes in very particular ways. So um, I want to, this is the point where we show the videos. So, um, so Sean, if you want to go ahead and click on that. Are we there? There we go. This forest is about to go up in flames. Don't worry, it's intentional. 
We're here in Roslyn, Washington at a prescribed burn, and it's actually supposed to make the forest more resistant to fires because these woods have been really unhealthy. Think of a prescribed burn as a vaccination against really, really bad fires. And just like giving out shots, you need people who know what they're doing. This is like the main tool of prescribed fire. Get a little bit of a arm workout. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Today, prescribed burning is showing up more and more in state forest management policies. Why? Because wildfires are way worse than they used to be. A century of poor forest management and fire suppression has created a lot of fuel to burn. All that underbrush acts like kindling. Climate change leads to hotter temperatures and longer dry periods, which create perfect conditions for a wildfire to start. Put all that together and you have the makings of a disaster. Today's wildfires can even take out big old growth trees that have historically been able to stand up to wildfire. Take this piece of ponderosa pine that's been around for over two centuries. This cross section of a tree trunk is about to teach us a bunch of history, so show some respect and pay attention. Before European settlers arrived, Native American tribes in the Western US were already forest management experts. Many native peoples embraced fire as part of certain ecosystems. In fact, many trees in the West, like ponderosa pines and giant sequoias, are made healthier by regular human-managed fire. The Yakima Nation used prescribed burning to keep the forest healthy and to cultivate different resources they depended on, like berry plants. But when colonists showed up, it didn't occur to them that the forests were so impressive and the timber so strong because they'd been taken care of by humans. I mean, there were very colorful responses. In some instances, it is, they're just burning things up. They would also notice these abundant berry fields, and they wouldn't always make the connection. In 1910, there was a massive wildfire that spread across Montana, Idaho, and Washington. As a result, the federal government was like, we've got to take better care of these forests. Time for a forest service. Up until that point, there had been some debate over prescribed burning. But the new agency imposed a hard and fast fire suppression policy. No burning, no exceptions. Traditional burning was outlawed and tribal members were punished for practicing it. And it turns out that was not the best way to keep forests healthy. It was also really culturally oppressive. Preventing fires was another way of directly reducing native influence within our ancestral territories. And forests that had been managed by humans for thousands of years were suddenly growing wild and unchecked. So that's basically how we end up here, in a period of time that's warmer than ever before in recorded history, with a whole lot of very unruly forests. Around the 1970s, some ecologists started to point out that suppressing fire in forests was actually making wildfire damage worse. And that way of thinking has gotten more and more traction. 2014, we had a record wildfire year, and in 2015, we broke that record. I think people were, what are all the tools in the toolbox? How do we protect ourselves? How do we make our forests more healthy? In 2017, the state of Washington made prescribed burns central to its 20-year fire management plan. We obviously are inheriting a problem that's been over 50 years in the making. It's going to take us a while to get on top of it, but we are going to make a significant difference in the health of our force, and it will include prescribed fire. Which brings us full circle, working with fire instead of suppressing it, a practice that's still alive in many tribal cultures today. What we're really looking at is a group of people that have been able to survive for thousands of years based on their relationship, interaction, and management with resources. I don't feel like you're going to have a very efficient project in today's world ignoring a thousands-year-old data set. Okay, thank you, Sean. Let's see. Oh, can I get back my slides? So, uh, so you can see, thank you. So you can see with this video how important I, I was. I was a consultant on this video, um, which was really an honor to be asked. Um, and so, uh, but, I, you know, I mean, I'm not going to say I'm an expert in cultural burning. I'm not, because I'm not out there on the land doing it. I just know that that um, there is this expertise that, that Native people are still um, engaging. In fact, there's even, um, I was at um, UC Davis earlier this year giving a talk. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, 
Yes, it was UC Davis, and I do a lot of, I was before this doing a lot of traveling, um, doing a lot of university talks, and sometimes I forget like where it was that I um, had this conversation. But, but yes, it was University of California at Davis where they have a really robust, um, one of the best indigenous studies programs there, including a PhD program. And um, they actually have a course, an entire course on cultural burning, where they take the students out onto the land and, um, and teach them how to do this, which is really pretty amazing to me. Um, I teach a course on traditional ecological knowledge at my university, um, and it's a community-based course where we take the students out onto the land um, because where our university is, is in the county of San Diego. Uh, and most people don't know this, but San Diego has more uh, Indian reservations in the county than any other county in the US, um, which is pretty astounding for, um, for most people to hear. When we have 18 reservations within the county. They're small, but they are still land bases. And because um, they are um, you know, sovereign land bases, we, uh, we have the ability to actually take students out onto the land and work with those communities um, in a variety of different ways. Um, and many of our classes do that. And my class is, um, is one of them that does that. So, so we actually go out on, into the communities and and look at how uh, how different ways that they engage um, traditional knowledge in their uh, in their sovereignty projects in the, well really their their nation building projects. So um, so that's just a, a sort of an idea of you know kind of how I'm get, engaging this knowledge myself as a as a teacher. So. Um, so indigenous knowledge is, as I said, it's applied knowledge. We can see this in the controlled burning um, practices of native people, but that's only one, um, one aspect of this applied knowledge. There's um, lots of other ways that native people are uh, still using traditional ecological knowledge. Um, for example, in forest management projects, uh, there's uh, a lot, you know, a, a fair amount of uh, research about that uh, and I would refer you to the work of Kyle White, that's W-H-Y-T-E, who's um, an incredibly prolific writer about um, these topics. Um, so, you know, forest management is a huge one um, and, not, and, and not just cultural burning but the ways that, you know, native people are still doing forest management in other kinds of ways. Also, fisheries management and, and working to bring back uh, collapsing populations, for example, of salmon, which um, are, are well on the road to becoming extinct due to um, dam building, particularly. So, um, so that's just a word on, on what traditional ecological knowledge looks like as, um, as praxis, as something that's still very much alive in Native communities. But the problems, okay, so the problems about traditional ecological knowledge and Native people's very in-depth um, practices on the land as land managers, as people with, with scientific knowledge, you know, we have written about this in a way that's been called different kinds of things, um, including Native science, and, and this comes as a term from um, the scholar Gregory Cajete, who wrote an entire book called Native Science um, that argues that indigenous knowledge is empirical knowledge um, that has been used for thousands and thousands of years based on thousands and thousands of years of observation and interaction living within particular environments. So this is, um, you know, very, very important knowledge that Native people have always had. But what happens with uh, settler colonialism and settler colonialism as uh, a system that was brought here by Europeans um, and then crystallizes into a structure of domination that is uh, focused on the elimination of the natives. So in that 
framework of settler colonialism, the way that we write about it and teach about it, is that it's a um, it's uh, uh, the impulse of the state to eliminate native peoples in order to replace them. And so, as such, it's not just colonization is not just a historic event. It's something that um, has become a structure that continually um, plays itself out ongoingly in the systems of the state. So it becomes systemic. It's political, it's social, it's textual, it's cultural, it's all of these things. And, uh, and so it's, it's been um, crystallized into all, in the American system in all these different ways. Um, my previous book that I wrote, which was co-wrote with Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, who is the author of an Indigenous People's History of the United States, um, we talk about all of the, the ways that these master narratives have played out in um, American society in really common ways by identifying the most common myths about Native people. Um, and, and so the, the foundation, the way that we write about it in the book, the foundation of all of these myths built upon the the uh, you know the ground of indigenous elimination is is that it really began as a process to inferiorize native people. Um, I would argue this is not just a racial project. This began long before there was a, even a concept of race uh, in in European society. Um, this really began as religious domination um, based on principles and edicts from the Catholic Church, you know, in, in medieval uh, Europe, going back to the 15th century. Um, and so it becomes codified into American law, um, and not just American law, but the entire, I mean, you go back before uh, before we even had something called the United States, it was well ingrained into the colonies. Um, this idea that indigenous people were just inherent, well, ignorant savages, right? I mean, the word of savagery was very common in the colonies and um, they very commonly referred to Indians as savages, meaning, you know, wild men, you know, this concept that, uh, that Indians were just children of the forest. They were no more than than beasts, you know, no different than the wolves. Even George Washington used that language, um, beasts of the wild. Um, and, and so this, this uh, you know, we understand this now as, as social Darwinism, it becomes um, part of the, the early language, the early conceptualization of, of the hierarchy of humans in early anthropology in the mid 1800s with, um, you know, white European people being on top of that pyramid, always superior with um, everybody else somewhere on a lower rung of that ladder of, of um, civilization. And indigenous peoples really pretty much always at the bottom. We were always, the you know, classified as barbarians. Um, and so this, this, you know, paradigm of indigenous inferiority has become so embedded in the American cultural and political landscape that, um, and, and including the legal system um, with things like the doctrine of discovery, um, the trust doctrine, the plen plenary power doctrine, and many others. These are, uh, these are legal regimes that construct what we know as federal Indian law today that um, keep native people constrained to a hegemonic relationship, constrained in a relationship of hegemony um, by the, the US government, which is really uh, in opposition to the, to the sovereignty-based treaty relationship. So, so we have this you know, sort of common knowledge that, that Indians are just, oh, the, just the, the ignorant savages that you know, the United States rightfully 
uh, conquered in order to gain access to the land because, you know, based on, now we're talking about Manifest Destiny and how Manifest Destiny was really the, the narrative that legitimates um, and rationalizes uh, this, uh, this history of the violent taking uh, of land and, um, and elimination of, of the native populations. Um, and so, so the result of all of that is that, you know, we have these myths about native people, you know, exam the examples are, you know, um, native peoples are, um, they were backwards and uncivilized and they needed civilizing by the United States. Um, indigenous people are prone to alcoholism. Um, native people are, um, you know, lazy and ignorant. And native people are um, always on the take, always on the dole from dole, you know, always accepting money from the federal government or, you know, we get monthly checks from the federal government, things like this that, that we often hear um, mistaken for common knowledge um, and but that are fundamentally wrong. So anyway, that's what that the book does is it dismantles and debunks all of this knowledge by um, creating a much more accurate picture of uh, the historical processes that got us to this place. Um, one of those myths that we often hear is the, I, the, the idea that Native peoples and Indians were no, nomads, nomadic people, um, and that they didn't know how to use the land properly, right? This is how, um, this is one of the, the big, um, Kind of, kind of constructions that was used to dispossess native people of their land because we weren't, you know, building civilizations of uh, like Europeans were great big cities, even though there is actually a very deep history of those kinds of complex cities that were built on this continent um, centuries before Europeans even got here. There's lots of evidence for it in places like Cahokia, um, the, the, Hohokam people in the Southwest uh, and others, um, but most people don't even know about those things. Um, but the point of this is that indigenous peoples were not basic wandering nomads, wandering around on the land aimlessly. Um, the vast majority of them were agriculturalists, they were farmers, um, sedentary people who would sometimes go, you know, engage in hunting for protein, you know, meat for uh, to subsidize or, you know, supplement their diets. Um, some tribes were migratory, uh, like the Plains people um, were people that had uh, places that were their, uh, were their winter grounds and their summer grounds. We call this the seasonal round. Um, and so many tribes practice those kinds of um, traveling traditions, not unlike the way people live today, you know, who are very mobile. We live in a very mobile society. Native people were mobile, but that does not mean the same thing as nomadic. Um, there were always homelands and territories that um, they traveled within. Um, so, uh, so because of all of this, these master narratives of indigenous inferiority, Europe, Europeans and Americans could not recognize the fact that native people have been on the lands for millennia, many millennia, and that the fact of that, uh, those ancient land tenure systems, this is the very definition of sustainability. And so um, this is what we're fighting against to try to, um, to, to get scholars and researchers and scientists to understand that indigenous societies based on sustainable um, um, principles have a lot to teach uh, the world about, you know, especially in this particular historical moment that we're in that has to do with climate change and, you know, massive environmental disruption. And now in the t a time of global pandemics. Okay, so this brings us to the concept of planetary health. Um, this is something that is new knowledge to me. I, in all the research I've been doing all, all of the years that I've been doing it, um, I only recently 
came into um, contact with this 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 new field that's being called planetary health. Um, it it really only has emerged in the, about the last four to five years, um, and it began with a, uh, a project called the Rockefeller Lancet Commission um, in, and it was a, uh, a, it was a conference on what they called planetary health. And it's, uh, it happened in 2014 and it resulted in a white paper. And this is a screenshot right here of um, what this, uh, this white paper looks like. And it's 50 some pages and and what it was was a it was a conference that brought together a diverse group of scientists uh, coming together to, uh, that to make links between human health and and the environment. So, you know, you know we have a field of studies called environmental health, which does that already, but but this new kind of emerging field of planetary health brings in to the conversation um, um, a wider swath of different kinds of scientists, such as um, people in medicine, people in um, uh, uh, virology and zoonotics and epidemiology and uh, it, you know, as well as biodiversity experts. So it's really making the links between uh, understanding ultimately how the human population is um, exposing ourselves to new pathogens that threaten human health. Um, and so it's based on the, the knowledge that, you know, the, the modernity, right, technology of the last 100 to 150 years has really lengthened the life of the average human. So, um, so we know and which, you know, we can see in massive population growth, for example. Um, so, so here we are, you know, a, a century, maybe century and a half of technology, which has um, dramatically lengthened human lifespan and allowed this population growth, um, but that we're now at this tipping point where human health is beginning to suffer because of the impacts of development on the environment. Um, and so this is where um, a lot of the pandemic information factors in. So um, when you, and they, they address this uh, uh, quite a lot in, in this paper, uh, pandemics, um, you know, the epidemiology and the, the, the convergence of epidemiologists and virologists and, and zoonotic scientists really, you know, looks at this, this kind of exploding knowledge about um, new kinds of pathogens that are finding their way into human human populations doing this cross species contamination. I don't think that's what they call it. They they have a better term for it than that. But that's um, but that's what it amounts to. Um, that you know we see things like uh, you know Ebola um, and um, MERS and SARS and these various coronaviruses that are. Uh, making that species jump from from wild animals into human populations um, because of the constant encroachment into um, the environments of these animals and um, and the exploitation of these animals and things like um, you know wild animal markets like we've seen um, so so you know it's obviously really complex there's a lot more to it but um, but this is the this planetary health field is the acknowledgement and the recognition of all of that that um, it's human it's rampant human development um, and the loss of biodiversity that that um, is creating these conditions of where we we now find ourselves at this tipping point um, and global pandemics being 
um, a, a very serious one. Um, and if you are familiar at all with any of the the current uh, media, it's been so front and center that where we've seen uh, you know lots of experts being interviewed in um, news programs and all kind you know all kinds of media talking about um, how you know there's been they've epidemiologists and virologists have known for years that it's only it's not a matter of if but when the next big pandemic is going to come that you know is a major threat to the entire uh, human race um, and from what I've seen um, the this current coronavirus and COVID-19 is not the big one so um, even as significant and, and disrupting and huge, you know, amazingly, uh, you know, d disturbing as this thing, this thing has been, this is not um, what they have been predicting. They've actually modeled a, you know, global influenza pandemic that would be far more um, virulent and um, fatal. So, um, so now we know that there's been um, lots of red flags been put up by, uh, by people by scientists doing this kind of work in in um, pandemics um, and that it has been systematically ignored um, probably not just by our government but by other governments as well um, but uh, certainly especially by our particular government and so this white paper um, the conclusion that it comes to is that is three things and they say that um, that it's it's the failures of imagination, knowledge, and governance, um, which includes an over-reliance on economics as a measure of human progress. So, so this is what's, um, what needs to be addressed. They're basically saying that um, we need to imagine new kinds of ways of being on the planet in order to avoid these, this major pandemic uh, catastrophic scenario that, that they foresee. So failure of imagination, of knowledge. This is what I, this is what's caught my attention. Um, some other things that factor into the way that I'm thinking about this are, um, are, let's see, I, so I should just back up and say that um, my coming across this, um, this research on planetary health and the way that these various kinds of science uh, science experts are writing about it um, is is something that needs it, clearly we need different perspectives we need a different way of thinking about how we as humans um, live on the planet um, this. Uh, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but in my thinking of all of this, what also informs my opinions or my um, my perspective is is some of the material I've been reading in the last several years about um, the decline of U.S. empire. So there is there's a um, a wide variety of literature out there. Um, what some of you may know about is the work of Johann Galtung here. Um, he is an elder scholar who is known also as the father of peace studies um, and conflict resolution, um, which is, which is a, another discipline. Um, and he has been talking about the, the fall of US empire for many years. In fact, wrote an entire book called The Fall of US Empire, and then what? And that came out in 2009. Um, lots of stuff. One of those guys, amazingly prolific writer. He's written over 100 books. I mean, he's like Noam Chomsky like that, just you know, uh, incredibly prolific. Um, so his, his stuff is really uh, intriguing to me and I think needs to be paid attention to. Um, something else I found a couple of years ago, a few years ago, is this here. It's a, a, a study out of the, the Pentagon. Um, actually, it was really a study out of the U.S. Army College that uh, is called At Our Own 
peril um, the Department of Defense risk assessment in a post-primacy world. Basically, what this study is talking about is the collapse of American um, primacy on the global stage. So they know it's coming or is already here. Um, the, 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 the loss of inf American influence on the global stage is, is here. So this is, to me, another signal of um, American you know, empire collapsing. Um, and then there's uh, the work of Joseph Tainter. Uh, he's, um, he's a teacher. I can't remember. He's a professor. I can't remember where. But um, you can, there's, uh, his work is called, is on the collapse of complex societies. And um, if you Google on him, you will find various talks that he's done. And uh, he also wrote a book um, of that of that title, um, The Collapse of Complex Societies. So, you know, he's definitely of the opinion that we are in the middle of one of those kinds of collapses. And then um, the material on climate change, um, something that I've also um, been studying for a long time. Um, I have been educated in the idea of climate change being anthropogenic. Um, I, without getting into it too deeply, um, I'm reading other scholarship and research that um, questions whether or not, you know, the degree to which it is anthropogenic. Um, and I think that um, that scholarship has not been paid enough attention to. I think um, the, I think climate change narratives are politicized like everything else gets politicized, and I think that there need, it needs to be questioned a little more deeply. Um, but regardless of whether or not climate change is anthropogenic, what we do have is the, the massive environmental destructive, destruction um, that is human-caused, that uh, you know, has led to all kinds of other problems um, that we can name without even talking about climate change that it, that compromises and um, you know threatens human existence. Um, to say nothing else about the fact that we are we now find ourselves in this you know what scientists call the sixth mass extinction event. Um, so so we so my point is that we don't even need to talk about climate change to recognize that we are uh, we are threatening our own existence because of are the way that we live on on the earth based on um, extractivist economies and um, you know private you know a worldview of private property that that does not accord respect to the natural world itself. So um, so the bottom line for all of this in in my thinking is that. Um, as I mentioned, you know, in this realm of planetary health and epidemiology, um, they have emphasized that uh, a global pandemic is inevitable. It's not a question of if, but when, um, but that the SARS-2 coronavirus and COVID-19 is not the big one. Um, history teaches us that ecocide is always parallel to genocide and culture side. So, um, so here again, we're talking about biodiversity. So the law, the loss of biodiversity through um, through the constant encroachment, you know, deforestation in the Amazon, for example, and all the ways that um, the natural world is being um, extracted from and and uh, destroyed in order to accommodate human populations. Um, this is this is what's 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 narrating what's happening to us now. So another way of kind of looking at that is that what happened to indigenous peoples in the processes of colonization is now happening to everybody else. So um, so connecting you know ecocide to um, to now it's not just genocide. It's just you know the threat of human human existence uh, altogether. So um, we're all sort of in this together at this point, and, you know, 
until and unless we change how we live on the earth. Um, and so my argument is that indigenous knowledge, because of the ways native people, and not just in the US or on the North American continent, also in the South American continent, um, other, other continents as well, and especially Africa, I would say, um, where, where bedrock nations, indigenous societies um, are still in existence, still alive, still, still uh, uh, you know, practicing their cultures and their traditions, even in the face of these you know, incredibly uh, genocidal and hegemonic forces uh, of the nation state system. We, um, we have knowledge, indigenous knowledge contains these critical keys to planetary sustainability. So, um, so this is part of the, the land, Rockefeller Lancet Commission's failure of knowledge is the failure to acknowledge, one of its failures is, is the failure to understand sustainability of other peoples that don't fit within the Eurocentric model of um, how to be on the earth. So, um, so this is ultimately, I'm arguing, this is a problem of epistemology. This is a problem not just of science. It's partly a problem of science. Uh, it's partly a problem of science, partly a problem of economics. But, you know, to hear mainstream uh, pundits and experts talk about it, um, it's really limited to that. But, but ultimately, it's really a problem of philosophy and epistemology, how we understand our place in the world as humans. Um, and this is where indigenous knowledge has a lot to teach um, the rest of the world if we are truly interested in building a different world, a world that is sustainable for, for not just humans, but also for um, the other life forms that, that we as humans inhabit. Um, and from an indigenous perspective, we would call this a relational, uh, a relational paradigm, relational uh, uh, view um, or, uh, you know, a uh, way that we um, situate ourselves as part of the natural world, but not as the dominators of the natural world, which is really that Eurocentric kind of perspective. So, um, so I want to leave you with a, a quote here um, by a guy named Dr. Peter Daszak, who is a zoologist, and he was on Democracy Now! just um, a couple of days ago, uh, and he just barely sort of touches on this. Um, and, and he says, this is a quote, he says, we need to reevaluate our relationship with the environment. Um, and so that's a great starting place um, for all of us to begin to uh, incorporate into the ways that we imagine ourselves being on, on the earth. Um, Indigenous knowledge has a lot to teach us um, so that we can avoid um, global pandemics, you know, hopefully avoid it. I mean, I don't know if it's avoidable anymore, but, um, you know, this is a long term. This is the big picture. This is what what's really staring us in the face right now. If we're looking at building a sustainable world um, is really examining and and reconstructing the, the the epistemological foundations of the way that we live so um so that's that's how i'm thinking about it these days i'm going to leave you with this last slide um that's just some resources there's a, a, a website called the planetary health alliance um this is housed at ha harvard university um, and it's up to over 400, uh, 200 partnering institutions on a global scale. Um, lots of resources there, lots of research, references to um, a wide variety of uh, sources. Um, so, so go to this page for those, that research.
Uh, here is, you'll find a link to the Rockefeller Lancet Commission report. Uh, and then um, I recently wrote an article about this. It was published in High Country News. And, and it's just basically an encapsulation of everything I just said to you over the last um, 40 minutes or so. So I'm going to stop there. And uh, if we have time for question and answers, then I guess we'll move on to that. Thank Incredible. You Thank you so much, Dina. That's great. Um, so you covered a lot of ground, and we have a few questions here that I think we can encapsulate into sort of two categories. Um, and you covered all kinds of issues with indigenous knowledge. You talked about ways in which um, we're moving towards, um, you know, different models of history, really, right? Um, but the thing that I think is lacking and the thing that um, I think some of the questioners were asking about is, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about pandemics and people are talking about, you know, the Spanish flu and they're going back to these European pandemics. But there's al almost no talk, close to zero talk about the pandemics that uh, indigenous people have suffered yes. around the globe, but certainly in North and South America. So. Um, you know, uh, how do you feel about that? Why do you think that is the case? Yeah, well, I mean, that's a great question. And um, it's something that Roxanne and I have talked about, you know, if we were to go back and like revise the our book on the 21 myths about indigenous peoples, we would add the myth in there that native people were, uh, you know, s were susceptible to foreign diseases. Um, there is there's a lot of uh, confusion around that, but there's and there's also a lot of new information coming out about that. You know, we have this narrative in this country, um, and it's really uh, um, perpetuated a lot by uh, historians um, that you know, well, we didn't really have genocide in this country because you know most of the Indians were killed off by germs, right? So, so imported diseases from Europe. Um, and, and what that does is it, it does, it accomplishes a few things. And one of those things is, is it avoids accountability for all the ways in which um, Europeans and then Americans um, visited these incredible histories of violence that, that are ultimately what um, what ha is responsible for um, population decline and then the the implantation of this this new state? Did native people experience pandemics as a result of foreign diseases? For sure, that's for sure happened. But it's not the only thing that happened, and it's not the only thing that we can um, talk about um, to to understand you know this to understand settler colonialism as a given like a natural process because that's often how our history is written and understood right that it was just inevitable it was just a natural thing that you know other people were going to come here and take over the land um that's not the case um some research i came across recently um, was some, it was just last year a uh, 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 archaeology study that showed in the Southwest um, where uh, there was a population decline due to um, some kind of epidemic, uh, some kind of illness that ravaged a community. I can't remember which pueblo. It was one of the pueblos in in New Mexico. Um, but what the what the research showed was that there the Spanish so the Spanish right the Spanish was who really invaded that area this particular epidemic didn't strike that community until a hundred years after the Spanish had been there so in other words it wasn't that the Spanish got there and you know all of a sudden you know some epidemic happened and it was no fault of their own Right. So it was that, you know, you have a hundred years of of um, incredibly violent Spanish rule. And then you have this 
um, this this epidemic that causes massive population decline. Well, in a hundred years, what you have is like you know massive systematic oppression, um, and you know a whole range of um, social realities that create the conditions for such an epidemic to result in population decline. So, um, so the the research you know is is changing that narrative. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we as Native people, we all have those stories in our families, somebody who died from tuberculosis or from smallpox or from some other kind of, you know, horrible, um, you know, uh, disease. But, uh, yeah, so isn't it interesting that we don't hear about it in the current historical moment? It's very convenient. Right. Right, of course. Um, so I think the second thing, and, and just real quickly here, um, uh, folks are concerned about indigenous people in this environment. Obviously, um, COVID-19 is affecting a lot of indigenous communities disproportionately, right? Um, and that's not surprising to anyone who knows the history, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I would just like to end it with something sort of hopeful. Is there um, a platform that people can reach you or um, people who are con like concerned about these kinds of issues? We have a number of people asking how they can be allies and best be allies rather than kind of, you know, just caring and not doing anything. So Yeah, I appreciate that. And that's, that's a great question. I get that question a lot. Um, as far as a platform, um, uh, I, I don't know. I would, I, there's not like one central place that I can think of right now that would be a good hub for mm -hmm. uh, reaching out. Um, but to the larger question, uh, you know, I did see something about the Navajo Nation. So the Navajo Nation has been really in the center of the news lately um, about, you know, it disproportionately, COVID-19 disproportionately affecting um, that community. Um, uh, I would say also be careful about, you know, fake um, fundraising sites. Like that happened with Standing Rock a lot. There was a lot of fake fundraising sites. So if you're going to support Native people, um, really do your homework on that and do use your best discernment to not, um, you know, send money to some fake organization. Um, so, but, but more broadly, I'm going to just refer you to my book because um, the book addresses this a lot, um, very deeply about, you know, how native, how non-native people can ally with native people in these various projects um, that's you know and it, and it really comes back to having a really good grasp on the history about how we got to this place um, and how settler colonialism is still very much alive in the structure that maintains um, this the conditions where we can see some uh, indigenous communities being much harder hit by um, the, by this particular disease. So, um, so yeah, just continue to educate yourself and um, feel free to reach out to me. I can be reached at, at my website. Um, it's dgwconsulting.org. And um, I guess I'll put that in the chat box. Okay, wonderful. And if you want to stick around and, you know, talk in the chat, that's very cool. And we'll just make sure people are able to talk to you. Okay. Will do.